Hello, in this video I'd like to contrast our situation where we had these various first order logics that were expressively equivalent to the regular languages, to finite state automata, with Turing machines. So can we find a first order logic that's expressively equivalent to the Turing machines? And if so, what is it going to look like? This is actually very practical when it comes to analyzing the structures that are equivalent to the regular languages, because if there's something we can add to those structures to allow them to express Turing machines, because Turing machines are strictly more expressive than finite state automata, we know that we have strictly increased the expressivity of the language. That is, we've added something that we weren't able to talk about already. So this allows us to prove that there are various things that we can't talk about in these languages. So what is a Turing machine? Well, the most important distinction between finite state automata and Turing machines is that Turing machines have an unlimited amount of memory. This memory is organized into an infinite tape whose positions are indexed by the natural numbers. Every position on this tape will be labeled with some character from a finite alphabet, with a special blank character to save us from having to write infinitely many octothorps. There's also going to be a read-write head located at some position on the tape. I'm going to indicate it like this. And at any particular time, we're only allowed to read to and write to the memory at that particular position. And we're also going to have a finite set of states of memory similar to what we have with finite state automata. Where this memory is separate from the memory on the tape. Modern computers have a similar sort of duality uh, between uh, memory in registers on the CPU that's very easy and quick to access, and then memory that's a little bit harder to access. So the registers on the CPU is kind of like the, the states of memory that we are allowed to immediately access, and then the actual tape uh, is something that takes a little bit more to access, especially if the, we have to move the head to a particular location in order to be able to read memory there. I'm going to indicate the current state of memory with a special character above the indicator for the read-write head. This machine starts off with some word written on the tape and then blanks uh, infinitely afterwards in a particular start state with the read-write head at the first character, at position zero. We then have a set of instructions for how to advance the Turing machine forward in time. So these instructions specify what to do if you read a particular character and are in a particular state. And of course, there's only finitely many characters and finitely many states, so there's only finitely many instructions. It indicates that we should write a character to the current read-write head position. Uh, you could just have this be the same character as the character here if you don't want to uh, write anything at that position. It says to change to another state. Uh, again, you can stay in the same state if you want to, uh, but you're also allowed to change state. And it also tells the read-write head to move either one square left, one square right, or don't move at all. So what's going to happen is this head is going to move back and forth across the input word, back and forth across this extra uh, infinite, infinite amount of memory here, uh, possibly writing over the input, um, possibly writing stuff here, uh, and it's just going to keep going. And we would like it to somehow indicate when it's done. Uh, with finite state automata, we know when they're done. They're done when they have finished reading the input. And that makes things really nice and easy. We can predict exactly how long it's going to take for a finite state automaton to uh, uh, process a particular input. And we also know that the finite state automaton is going to finish processing the input. This Turing machine might get stuck in an infinite loop, and then it's not going to tell us yes or no. But we need some way of the Turing machine indicating when it's done. And so I'm going to add that as well. So uh, if, you're in, if you read a particular character and you're in a particular state, you can either accept 
reject, or continue. Again, just like finite state automata, we're interested in studying the set of words that cause the Turing machine to eventually accept. There are other ways of interpreting this as well. Uh, you might interpret this as an input-output function that uh, when it's done processing will write out an output word onto the tape and say, this is the output for the input that you gave me. But you can do the same sort of relationalization construction that we did in our multiple inputs video uh, to turn any function into a relation and recognize that relation. So we don't have to worry about input-output automata. If a Turing machine eventually either accepts or rejects, we say that it halts. And if it just keeps going forever, we say that it does not halt. In his paper on computable numbers, Alan Turing describes these as being analogous to a human computer. So back in the days, a computer referred to a human who does computation. A human computer doing calculations uh, on uh, grid paper, where each position of the grid can have a particular character, uh, although uh, here we have a one-dimensional grid. Uh, he explains why this isn't such a big deal. Turing then went on to explain how you could use these machines to do the various tasks that computers would have to do. For instance, he showed how you could simulate having a second tape of memory by interleaving, having every other character represent symbols on one tape and every other character represent symbols on another tape. And he took advantage of that to have short-term memory interspersed with long-term memory. Turing showed how you could use these machines to do various subroutines, uh, and in fact, how you could use them to do recursion. He showed how you could use these machines to skip ahead a fixed distance or move to a special marker. It's a very common task to want to, while you're processing the input, you probably don't want to like modify the input uh, that much. Um, but while you're processing the input, maybe you want to add a special marker character at the particular position you're at. Go somewhere else to like uh, dump off some data and process it and then come back to where you were. And so you need a special way of indicating the character that you were at uh, so that you can go back there exactly. And then finally, he showed how you could use these machines to calculate various real numbers. Computers back then would very often calculate uh, a lot of decimal digits of the result of a particular calculation. Nowadays, we have a really strong intuition for what Turing machines are capable of doing. All you have to do is take a modern programming language and allow the integers to take on arbitrarily large values and strings and arrays to be arbitrarily long, and anything you can do in this theoretical version of your programming language can be done by a corresponding Turing machine. The, the process of translating from this theoretical extension of your programming language to the Turing machine is very similar to the compiling process of turning an actual computer program into actual machine code. It's important to remember that the key property of Turing machines is their unlimited amount of memory. Otherwise, we have a finite state automaton. I find it really frustrating to see claims like Minecraft is Turing complete, when even in a purely theoretical Minecraft, where you don't have to worry about faraway parts of the world unloading, at least back when I was playing Minecraft, I couldn't figure out how to build an infinitely long tape or rather a finitely long tape that could make itself longer if necessary. Because in the process of this calculation, we're not actually going to use all infinity amount of memory. We're only going to use some finite amount of memory, but we don't know how much memory we're going to need to use in our calculation. And so we have to be ready if the Turing machine uh, uses up all of our memory and, and needs to go past a certain point, to add on more squares to the tape so that the head can uh, access them. So for instance, if you had a computer that had a special instruction that says, instruct the user to go out and buy more memory, uh, then I would say that that machine is Turing complete. Because there are actually three things that a particular Turing machine can do given a particular word as input, it can either halt and accept, 
halt and reject, or never get around to halting at all, there are actually two different classes of languages defined in terms of the Turing machines. There's the recursive languages, where there's some Turing machine that always halts given any particular input that accepts exactly the words in the language. This sort of Turing machine will always tell you, yes or no, this word is in this particular language. On the other hand, you have recursively enumerable languages, where we only require that there's some Turing machine that accepts all of the words of the language. Words not in the language, it can either reject, or it can just run forever and never get around to accepting. These are called the recursively enumerable languages because you can actually build a machine that lists out the elements of this language. You simply have a parallel processing sort of situation. Uh, you're, you're kind of slowly adding in new words into this uh, giant parallel processing cluster and you have each computer within that cluster is working on determining whether a particular word uh, is in the language or not by, by running this uh, Turing machine on that particular input. And then anytime one of those machines in the parallel processing cluster uh, ac accepts a word, uh, it, it outputs it. And by being clever about how you set up this parallel processing network, every word's Turing machine is going to get enough processing time uh, to be able to accept that word. And so every word that is accepted by some Turing machine is eventually going to get outputted, and of course everything else is not going to get outputted. The recursively enumerable languages aren't closed under complementation. If you have a Turing machine that takes in a particular string, interprets it as code, runs the code, and then uh, accepts if the code eventually halts, the complement would have to be a machine that you can feed any program to, and if it doesn't halt, it will tell you that it won't halt. This is the infamous halting problem. There is no program that will universally tell you if a particular piece of code won't halt. There are some heuristics for solving this problem, heuristics being algorithms that usually work but sometimes don't. Uh, such as, for instance, uh, identifying if the program goes into an infinite loop. But there is no one computer program that can universally determine if a particular piece of code won't halt. And that's probably for the best. If you wrote a computer program to hunt for counterexamples to Fermat's last theorem, and if there's one out there, it prints it out, and if it doesn't find one, uh, it keeps looking forever. Uh, if you could determine if this computer program ran forever, then you would have a proof of Fermat's last theorem. And you could use this to solve pretty much any math problem. So it's a good thing they don't exist, so mathematicians have something to do. On the other hand, the recursive languages are closed under complementation. Because they're required to halt given any particular input, you can simply switch the accept condition and the reject condition within the description of the Turing machine. And the recursive languages have a bunch of other really exciting closure properties, such as closure under concatenation, closure under Kleene star, closure under uh, union and intersection, and difference. But there are two big limitations to them. First of all, in order to be able to claim that a particular Turing machine gives you a recursive language, you're going to have to be able to show that that Turing machine halts given any input. And again, we said that the halting problem is not universally solvable. So when you define a particular recursive language, you're going to have to do a little bit of work to verify that the Turing machine that you're describing actually does halt given any input. Sometimes this is very easy, sometimes this can be kind of tricky. The other problem with recursive languages is that they're not closed under projection. That is, if we have a Turing machine that accepts pairs, and you encode pairs in the same way, uh, I guess you can encode them separated by a comma if you want, uh, because uh, those are equivalent. Uh, but say we have a particular Turing machine here uh, that given two words, x and y, determines whether or not they have some property then we would also like to build a Turing machine that determines if there exists an x 
such that phi of x, y. This is a kind of projection, and it's really important when we're proving an equivalence with a language uh, for showing that things work with both the existential and the universal quantifier. But generally speaking, you can't do this. If we have a particular Turing machine that uh, always halts, that determines whether uh, phi holds of x comma y, um, the naive way of doing this, of determining if there is an x such that phi of x y given a particular y, is to simply go through all of the possible strings one by one, test on our Turing machine for phi whether or not x comma y is true. If so, output yes, and if not, keep going, keep trying other strings. Unfortunately, the machine that we've constructed to determine if this formula is true gives us a recursively enumerable language. This machine might not halt if there's no x that makes this true. So the recursive languages project to recursively enumerable languages, which is not what we want. We would need the recursive languages to project to give us recursive languages if we wanted some sort of equivalence with first order logical languages. So alas, no first order logic corresponds directly to the Turing machines in the same really nice way that we had a bunch of first order logics that corresponded to the regular languages or the finite state automata. What this means is that if we have a first order logic that's capable of expressing the Turing machines, then it's actually capable of expressing much, much more. We call these sets of words arithmetic, and we'll see why in a future video. But these logics can express not only the behavior of Turing machines, but also can talk about the halting behavior of Turing machines, and actually halting problems on top of halting problems on top of halting problems. Uh, so they're actually much more expressive. A logic that's capable of expressing Turing machines would also not be decidable. That is, that there wouldn't be an algorithm that would determine if any particular formula of that logic was true or false. Contrast this with the case of Buki arithmetic, where I've shown you an algorithm for determining whether a particular formula is true or false. In order to be able to determine if any formula is true or false, it's going to have to be able to deal with formulas that express Turing machines. And because of the halting problem, we know that there's no universal way of determining whether a particular Turing machine is going to halt. The situation with these logics actually gets worse. We can't have a complete recursively enumerable axiomatization of any of these logics. So I guess I should start by clarifying a uh, complete axiomatization just means a set of axioms, a set of formulas for this logic from which all other true formulas follow. And of course we want it to be consistent and, and we want the axioms to actually be true. Of course, if we had false uh, axioms, uh, anything follows from false things. So uh, that's no good. Um, but suppose that we have a complete recursively enumerable. So for instance, the axiomatization I showed you for Pressburger arithmetic, where there were infinitely many axioms, but it was really easy to determine if something was or wasn't an axiom. Specifically, it's one of these things or this for an appropriate formula plugged into it. But really all we need is some way of determining whether a particular formula is an axiom or not. It turns out that having a complete recursively enumerable axiomatization actually gives us a decision procedure for deciding whether or not a particular formula in the logic is true or false. And that would contradict the halting problem. So a complete recursively enumerable axiomatization allows us to decide whether a particular sentence phi is true or false by running a program that I like to call Proof Hunter. Proof Hunter goes through every possible string using the same sort of parallel processing, uh, multitasking setup that we talked about earlier, and uh, checks to see if that string is a proof of phi. So what does it mean for a string to be a proof of something? So a formal proof is going to be a series of lines of mathematical statements. 
And it's going to look a lot like uh, showing your work in an algebra class, if you show your work really thoroughly. And your lines of the proof can either be axioms or they can be deductions from previous lines, right? Saying by this deduction rule and the fact that we've already proved these previous lines here, um, we get this new fact. And very often deductions are just of the form modus ponens, where if you know A and you know that A implies B, then you know B. Uh, but uh, deductions, again, could be whatever you want. I'm not being particularly picky about what uh, requirements I'm setting on what a formal proof system is. Uh, again, I, it just needs to be the case that when we're looking at deductions, uh, you can recognize uh, via a computer whether or not this deductive step is correct or not. Now, of course, when you write proofs in mathematics, uh, they're not going to be formal proofs. Really, the way that I like to think of proofs in mathematics is that you're trying to convince the audience uh, that a formal proof exists and you're going to show them how they could construct that formal proof uh, without going through the kind of slog of actually writing out all of the individual steps of the proof. And so what constitutes a proof in mathematics depends on your audience. If you're writing for uh, a, an audience of people who uh, really understand uh, formal logic and automata theory and all of those things, you can skip a whole bunch of steps where the audience knows how to fill in those steps. But if you're trying to write a proof for a more general audience uh, who might not know all of these different steps and how to fill them in, you're going to have to fill in more steps for them. And if you're a student writing proofs for your classes, uh, the goal is to demonstrate that you know how to fill in all of those gaps. It's important to note that there are formal proof systems that are robust enough to be able to capture nearly all of the proofs uh, that actually happen in actual mathematics. That nearly any proof that's written by a mathematician can be formalized into a formal proof in this particular formal proof system. So we can check to see if a particular string is a proof of phi. We'll also at the same time check to see if it's a proof of not phi. Uh, these checks might take forever if it takes forever to check whether a particular line is an axiom or not. But again, by uh, doing this parallel processing multitasking thing, we don't have to worry about that. When it encounters either a proof of phi or not phi, that particular process is going to be given as much computation time as it needs to discover that fact. And depending on which one it discovers, if it discovers a proof of phi, it says yes, phi is true. And if it discovers a proof of not phi, it says no, phi is false. And because we said that our axiomatization was complete, every sentence is either, if it's true, provable, or if it's false, uh, its negation is provable because its negation is true. So this is a contradiction. We can't have a complete recursively enumerable axiomatization of a logic capable of expressing Turing machines because that would give us a solution to the halting problem. In other words, any logic that is capable of expressing Turing machines does not have a complete recursively enumerable axiomatization. We have two options. We can either have an incomplete axiomatization that is recursively enumerable, that is something that we could list out with a computer, or we could have a complete axiomatization, but it's not something that we can list out with a computer. So it's a purely theoretical mathematical thing, this, this infinite collection, and we can't list out all of its elements in any sort of practical way. For instance, when we're talking about the theory of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication, uh, in the option where we go with an incomplete but still recursively enumerable axiomatization, we get what's called piano arithmetic, which has these particular axioms. But because it's incomplete, that means that there are statements of the first order logic of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication that aren't provable from that axiom system. Or we can have a complete but not recursively enumerable axiomatization, uh, in which case we get full arithmetic. Uh, and the axiomatization of this, I guess, is just all true statements about arithmetic. 
In the next video, I'll show how the first order logic of the natural numbers with addition and multiplication is capable of expressing Turing machines, uh, thereby completing a proof of Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. So I hope you'll join me for that. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments, and I hope to see you then.